Tonight, a former governor general grilled over his investigation into foreign interference. David Johnston questioned on his credibility. These allegations are put simply false. And his resistance to a public inquiry. How on earth are we to get the answers we need? Drifting danger, worsening air quality from Canadian wildfires. I'm worried about it affecting my lungs. And the traumatic return to charred ruins. Even driving up the Hammonds Plains Road this morning, the devastation. Plus, when two golf tour rivals team up. I'm as interested as anybody to see where that goes. The PGA and the Saudi-backed Live Golf on course for a contentious merger. It's clearly about the money for them. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. Millions are under air quality advisories tonight from those fierce flames devouring large parts of the country. This is what the Canadian capital looked like. Dramatic images of the city covered in smoke from wildfires. We'll get to that in just a moment. But we begin at a heated parliamentary committee hearing in Ottawa today where the prime minister's point person on foreign interference testified for three hours. David Johnston repeatedly defended his decision not to recommend a public inquiry. Instead, public hearings that will begin in a matter of weeks with the help of three special advisors. Could you tell us who the, those three advisors are? No, we have not begun that at all. CTV's Kevin Gallagher on the exchanges that were at times tense. Good morning. How are you this morning? Very good. On his way to testify, David Johnston dismissed opposition calls for him to resign. Well, I think the focus is on this report, and we'll have a chance to chat about it very soon. The Conservatives started by focusing on his relationship with the Prime Minister. You being a lifelong family friend, cemented over many summers as neighbouring cottagers in the Laurentians. Did you confirm or deny that, sir? The former Governor-General acknowledged his ties with the Trudeau family, but rejected it affected his report's objectivity. I don't believe I have a conflict of interest, and I would not have undertaken this responsibility had I had a conflict of interest. Johnson was also questioned about his conclusion there was no evidence of state-sponsored interference last election, contradicting what former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says he was told by CSIS after Johnston's report was published. Are you saying that you didn't have all of the material evidence and intelligence when you drafted your report? When we drafted our report, we had the intelligence with then available from CSIS and other sources. Johnson revealed he never spoke to Han Dong, despite determining allegations made against him in some media reports were false. I think interviewed the people who had um, information about uh, this particular matters. Uh, Mr. Dong, uh, at that time, I think, was uh, proceeding with his own uh, lawsuit, and uh, that we felt that this was something that uh, he should get on with. Johnson is determined to hold hearings into foreign interference, despite last week's House of Commons vote for him to be replaced. I'm going to make it very clear that I'm disappointed that he remains the special rapporteur despite the will of the House having voted that he should be removed. I'm going to make it clear that I disagree with this finding around not calling a public inquiry. The issue of foreign interference is one that needs to be taken seriously. And falling into baseless partisan attacks isn't worthy of the work that we need to do together as parliamentarians. While opposition parties continue to call for a public inquiry, Johnston has ruled that out because so much of the information is confidential. Instead, public hearings into foreign interference will start next month, Omar. All right, Kevin, thank you. Let's bring in CTV's chief political correspondent, Vashi Capellos, now for some analysis. Vashi, questions about David Johnston's credibility have persisted ever since that interim report was released exactly two weeks ago. He maintains there was no conflict of interest. Did today help him or hurt him? It really depends on who you ask, Omar. Liberals in government will tell you this is a man of unimpeachable integrity, and the testimony today proves that. The opposition, though, which is unanimous in its concern over whether or not, not just that there's a 
uh, an actual conflict of interest, but an appearance of one. Well, they say the testimony today did no favors for Mr. Johnson. He had kind of lengthy defenses about the degree to which he is or isn't a close friend of the prime minister. And from the opposition members I'm speaking to, that kind of cemented the position they came in there with. And so what does this all mean for the hearings expected to start in July and the second part of David Johnston's mandate? It's a really important question, and I think it's hard to see a situation in which the conclusions he reaches through these hearings are widely accepted by members of parliament, for example, from all parties, or even the Canadian public. And that is really going to be a problem, right? I think he's going into these hearings with the best of intentions. That's certainly the impression he left people with during this testimony. But at the same time, he didn't really fight the fire when it comes to questions of his credibility. And so as a result, I think it's you know going to be problematic for him over the next few months. All right, Vashi, thank you. Vashi Capellos in Ottawa, where... As we mentioned, the air hangs heavy with smoke tonight. A hundred million people are under air quality alerts on both sides of the border. This is a shot of New York today under a veil of smoggy haze. And much of that smoke is coming from Quebec. We're late tonight. There's word 7,500 people in the town of Shibugamo in the central part of the province were told to evacuate. Here's Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. Wildfires have ravaged more than 245,000 hectares of land in Quebec, nearly five times the size of Montreal. And the extreme fire zone in Abitibi has sparked most concern. One portion of the country is burning. In There's no rain in the forecast for days and days, and winds have picked up. It's good for smoke cover. We're, we, it's not smoky here, and we can use our aircraft, so we have much more visibility uh, in many areas. However, the wind is a bad thing for progression on fires. Uh, strong winds are going to be challenging in fighting the fires. The wind pushed the coat of smoke from both Ontario and Quebec wildfires south. Smog is now hovering over Ontario, Montreal, and covering Ottawa in a thick orange haze. I'm worried about it affecting my lungs, so I decided we're all in masks, the whole family today. Just in case, it's better to be safe than sorry, right? Since we have them from COVID anyway. Facing one of the worst air quality index in North America, the CFL's Ottawa Red Blacks outdoor practice was scrapped. So were high school track meets. These small microscopic particles and you breathe them in and they can penetrate really deep into your lungs. They get into your bloodstream. The smoke will poison air quality for days and the effects of Canada's wildfires reach across the border. This was the view near Boston today. Quebec has called in reinforcements. Hundreds of extra firefighters will join the ranks of those battling the fires within days. But in Setzil, it was rain that brought much needed relief. The evacuation order that had forced 5,000 people from their homes last Friday was lifted. Right now, uh, we're quite happy with the rain here in uh, Setsis, so uh, the people will be able to reintegrate their houses. Going home is on the minds of thousands of others in the Abitibi region. I left with just a small bag, he says. I left everything else behind. But Quebec police warned today it's crucial to stay away and follow evacuation orders. They've rescued about 20 people trapped behind walls of flames. Despite the extra help, authorities warn people should brace for a long season. It's likely some of the wildfires will burn for weeks. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Val d'Or, Quebec. And in Nova Scotia, the province's largest wildfire is still burning out of control. For many in Shelburne County, the road home remains closed. But for others, there's no home to return to. Officials now say 150 structures, including 60 homes and cottages, have been burned. Devastating, you know, like, I, I can't. I usually break out in tears most of the time just talking about it. Barry Doan ran to safety with just his cat and a suitcase. The artist lost his home, cottage, and all his paintings. Loss is something many in the Halifax area know all too well, as some return to see their homes destroyed for the first time, CTV's Paul Hollingsworth reports. When Greg Crookshanks surveyed the damage in his neighborhood. It seems like something out of a Stephen King movie, basically. He witnessed a jaw-dropping, blackened and scorched landscape roughly three kilometers from where the fire started in a neighboring community. Homes and cars destroyed by wildfires. 
Crookshank's property was saved, but he's horrified for those who have suffered the most serious damage. I just feel real bad for, for the people that lost their homes. Uh, whatever we're going through is, is minor compared to what, uh, what they're experiencing. While some homes burned to the ground, others close by did not. Halifax Deputy Fire Chief Dave Meldrum says wind and topography brought a randomness to the path of the fires. As this wildfire moved, like all wildfires, it threw embers up into the air, which landed hundreds of meters in front of the flame front. Hot airborne embers then landed on properties. Around the homes, on the back decks. Linda Dwyer's house is still standing. The damage and destruction to some of her friends' homes has been staggering. Even my paper guy, he's been 30 years. He's going to New Brunswick, they lost everything. At this fire station, many residents came to collect sampling kits to test for contaminated well water. Sorry, we're all out. Dwyer says returning to her community has been in many ways just as stressful as the day she was evacuated. And even driving up the Hammonds Plains Road this morning, the devastation. It's devastation people who live here say is beyond imagination. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Hammonds Plains, Nova Scotia. An environmental disaster of a very different kind in Ukraine tonight. The country's president says 80 towns and villages may be flooded after a major dam was destroyed. As CTV's chief international correspondent Paul Workman reports, both sides in the conflict are blaming each other. People living near the dam said they heard explosions in the middle of the night followed by a massive torrent of water gushing out of the Kahovka Reservoir, the level dropping 15 centimeters every hour, surging toward dozens of settlements downstream, what Ukraine called the critical zone. Dear Ukrainian, says this MP, I am witnessing with my own eyes this catastrophe created by Russia. Ukraine accused Russia of cynically blowing up the dam and power station to slow down the advancing Ukrainian army, in turn causing a generation of devastation for the land and the people who live there. It was an absolutely deliberately prepared explosion, said the Ukrainian president. They knew exactly what they were doing. This is yet another example of uh, the horrific consequences of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine said Russian forces continued to shell the area, even as people were being rushed to safety, as the reservoir steadily emptied, eliminating a vital supply of power and water both to drink and to cool Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Part of my village became an island, she says. People were trapped. I had to leave. A satellite view before the dam was destroyed and after with Russia insisting it was in fact bombed by Ukraine as an act of sabotage and battlefield deception. It will be some hours yet before the scale of this disaster is fully known. For now anyway, there doesn't seem to be any immediate safety risk at that huge nuclear power plant, Omar. Thank you, Paul Workman in London, where Prince Harry made history today as the first senior British royal in more than a century to take the stand. CTV's Daniel Hamamjan on day one of Harry's dramatic testimony against the tabloids, he says, destroyed his childhood. A media frenzy for a landmark legal event. Prince Harry, at war with the publisher of the Daily Mirror, claims his phone was hacked over a 15-year period and says he wants those responsible held to account. Inside courtroom number 15, a relaxed but serious Harry began by presenting a written statement. I always felt as if the tabloids wanted me single, as it sold more papers. He says he was labeled a playboy prince, a thicko, a cheat, an underage drinker. When private information like his medical details made it in the press, he feared he was being betrayed. His paranoia spiraled, his circle of friends shrank, relationships ended. On the rumors Diana's former lover, James Hewitt, was his biological father, Harry said it was hurtful and cruel. I remember on multiple occasions hearing a voicemail for the first time that wasn't new, he wrote. He says he thought it was a technical glitch 
as mobile phones were still relatively new, blasting them as utterly vile. He now believes the British tabloids used illegal means to obtain sensitive information about him, even listening to live calls he made on landlines. There are 31 journalists behind the articles being examined in court. They do not have to testify, but in the words of Prince Harry, it's absolutely appalling that they've refused to do so. The defense apologized for one instance of unlawful information gathering, but claimed the sources behind all the other stories were legitimate. Prince Harry will be back on Wednesday to give more evidence. Danielle Hamamjian, CTV News, London. Coming up after the break. Today is historic. A controversial merger between competing golf tours. Plus, the stirring assist from international firefighters arriving in Canada. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie kicked off his campaign for the Republican presidential nomination today, attacking former President Donald Trump. A lonely, self-consumed, self-serving mirror hog is not a leader. Christie was an advisor to Trump during his successful 2016 bid for the White House, but has become a vocal critic. Trump responded by calling Christie a failed governor. The two are in a crowded field of candidates that will include Trump's former vice president, Mike Pence, who will formally announce his candidacy tomorrow. Well, politics can be full of surprises, and so can pro sports. And tonight, we have a shocking merger to tell you about in the world of golf. The PGA Tour is joining forces with the Saudi-backed Live Golf Circuit. CTV's Heather Wright on the controversial deal. Two days before the start of the RBC Canadian Open, stunning news for golfers gathering in Toronto. This morning, the PGA Tour told players via email it is merging with Live Golf next year, a union few saw coming. I can't help but feel sad for the Canadian Open once again that this news drops Tuesday of what is our national open. Oh, yeah. Last year's Canadian Open was overshadowed by the first Live Tournament, a breakaway tour bankrolled by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. Players like Phil Mickelson, Dustin Johnson and Brooks Kepka took massive paydays to leave the PGA and play for Live and were widely criticized for participating in a league accused of sport washing the Saudi regime's brutal human rights record. There's nothing new under the sun in terms of political regimes using sport to buy influence or to gain influence. But I think the scale of the ambitions of regimes like um, Qatar, the UAE, um, and also now Saudi Arabia suggests a new level of sports washing. Saudi's PIF will remain a major investor in this newly merged league, though few other details have been shared. We've recognized that together, we can have a far greater impact on this game than we can working apart. My attitude is, why don't we give them a chance? John Kawaja helped get Live Golf off the ground and says the model, shorter tournaments with smaller fields, was developed to appeal to a younger demographic. He anticipates this merger will be good for the game. How does a player come back and will he be welcomed and is there, are there going to be hard feelings amongst players? Yeah, all, all of that is, yeah, those are all hurdles to get over. I think in the long run, uh, golf's had a good day. The PGA and Liv have been embroiled in bitter legal battles, which will now be dropped with this merger. Still questions and anger remain. Current PGA players turned down millions in Liv money on principle, only to see this deal take place. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. Stunning new video to show you tonight of a dramatic whale rescue. Not gonna like that. It took crews from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Parks Canada two hours to free the humpback, tangled in fishing gear off the coast of BC. Still ahead, fiery protests return to the French capital over pension reforms. Violent protests have flared up again on the streets of Paris. 
Labor unions want the French government to scrap a law that raises the retirement age to 64. But the lingering anger brought fewer people out than at the height of the demonstrations earlier this year. Elsewhere in France, there were somber reflections marking 79 years since D-Day. On beaches called Utah and Omaha, and sword and gold and Juno, they come ashore. A ceremony was held near Juno Beach, honoring the 14,000 Canadians who took part in the Allied assault during the Second World War. It's quite windy here today, like it would have been on, on D-Day, June the, the 6th of 44. As a soldier who has served, uh, that it, it really tugs on my heart. And uh, when I think of the sacrifice of those young men. More than 5,000 Canadians died during the Battle of Normandy. After the break, the case for a national firefighting force. More than 1,000 international firefighters are in Canada right now to contain fast-moving flames. It's help provinces desperately need, but it's also exposed to the gaps in domestic resources. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on a possible solution. A spirited song from more than 200 South African firefighters arriving at Edmonton International Airport, their bags packed full of hope. While crews from abroad are welcomed, for Canadian forests already reduced to ash, their arrival is simply too late. Various parts of the country are all active in wildfire right now. It's unprecedented. The haze from the wildfires in Quebec blanketing Toronto's skyline and with the smell of smoke through downtown, it shows just how far reaching the wildfires can be and why some are calling for a national response. When we get episodes like we're seeing this year, it quickly overwhelms any provincial ability to respond. Canada currently shares firefighting resources between provinces, but with active blazes burning across the country, Quebec acknowledging today that most are now unable to help. There's a, a lot of fire in Alberta and in BC and Ontario. Professor Mike Flanagan previously studied forest fires as a research scientist with the federal government. He's calling on Ottawa to assemble a national firefighting fleet that can be proactively deployed to support provinces across the country. 20 crews of 20, which is 400 people, and be ready to roll as soon as the fires arrive. Flanagan notes that even if other provinces have firefighting resources to share, it can take at least three days for their crews to arrive. You know, if we prevent the Littons or Fort McMurray's, that will more than pay for itself. Other forestry experts believe the country needs to rethink its entire natural disaster portfolio. We have to think strategically about how we create resources that can service floods, can service fires, and potentially other things like the hurricane. With scenes of a nation on fire now seared into the conscience of Canadians, the country is left to grasp for a helping hand from those arriving from a world away. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Here in our time of need. That's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching and good night.